One man on a mission to prove he can survive alone in the wild. Caught in a vicious snowstorm, a fateful slip sends him plunging off a cliff. I don't know how far I fell. It had to be 30, 40 feet. You have no control. You just hope you land and survive. Trapped on a ledge with sheer cliffs above and below. I'm here! No one even knows he's missing. I thought, I can't stay here. I'll just dwindle and die. I didn't think I was going to make it. Charlie Hedge is beginning the challenge of a lifetime. A solo hike in the Sierra Nevada mountains. With his 50th birthday approaching, he's out to prove he's still got what it takes to survive alone in the wilderness. I love the solitude. I love nature. I love the outdoors. This is something I always wanted to do. I consider myself being somewhat uh, self-sufficient. And so I think I kind of went up there alone Woo! in an attempt to prove that to myself, I think. Charlie has hiked in the mountains many times before, but always with friends. He knows that going alone will be his toughest challenge yet. I'm not getting any younger, and I'm not as in good a shape as I used to be, and I just wanted to get lost for a week. Walk away my worries. Charlie's long-term girlfriend of seven years, Julie, knows what this solo trip means to him. Charlie has spent a lot of time, I think, on his own and alone. He likes to go and do things uh, by himself. He got this wild hair, this idea that he really wanted to go and do this. and. I knew that there was no stopping him. I remember we hugged and kissed. She wished me luck. She told me to be careful, told me she loved me, and I told her the same. He's a big kid. <laughs> Charlie's a big kid. Charlie has planned a challenging route, a 30-mile circuit which he hopes to complete in just five days. His first day's climb takes him high into the Sierra Nevada peaks. Here, 20 miles from civilization, he can enjoy the beauty and solitude. It's just him and nature. The Sierra Nevada mountains, just a gorgeous spot. Being alone in the wilderness appeals to me because of the beauty. I just think Mother Nature has so much to offer. Unspoiled, quiet. As far as me going solo, Julie certainly had her concerns. I was concerned that maybe he wasn't in shape for this. He hadn't done a hike this length in a very long time. But Charlie makes good progress up the mountain. And after a grueling hike, he can reap the rewards of being self-sufficient. Part of the allure of going up there is fishing. You get high enough in the mountains and there's golden trout. Catching some fish and eating them that night. Nothing beats fresh fish. 
I felt real good that first day. In September, conditions in the Sierra Nevada mountains can change instantly and dramatically. But in his enthusiasm to get going, Charlie ignored weather warnings. By early evening, a fierce wind blows in and his peace is shattered. Wednesday night, the wind started picking up. And that's the first time I really felt exposed. You know you're alone, the wind's picking up, you're not sleeping, you're wondering, this isn't any fun, you know? I really became concerned for the first time Thursday when it really started to snow and the wind was just howling. The wind becomes a vicious snowstorm and Charlie hunkers down for the night, hoping it will pass. Pretty much snow everywhere. Woo! I got up and literally I was half buried in snow. But the weather was kind of breaking. Although the skies are clearing, the new snow has transformed the landscape. Navigating the route ahead will be a formidable task. At that point, there's really no trail, and if there was, it was buried in snow. I've been up there before years ago, and it just did not look familiar. For Charlie, this trip was to be the test of his ability to survive in the wild. But he now faces a difficult dilemma. To cut his trip short and head back down the mountain, or forge ahead with his original plan. I made the decision to continue. Get up and over the pass and get down the east side. The weather should be better down there, certainly. So I dug the snow out, packed everything up, headed up to the pass. Charlie struggles on for two hours, but hiking blind across the snowdrifts, he's way out of his depth. It was just very tough. I realized uh, that I might have made a mistake proceeding. But my rationality tried to overtake me, and I told myself, you'll be OK. Having committed himself to going forward, Charlie continues on over the hazardous pass. But here, the terrain is perilous. And now the weather takes another dramatic turn for the worse. It really started to snow and the wind was just howling. It was just blowing in my face. Despite the worsening conditions, Charlie is determined to complete his ambitious hike. But as the raging blizzard intensifies, he starts to realize that he's in over his head. While I was thinking what to do, my face is getting all cold from the wind, and I remember just turning around with the wind at my back. I don't remember tripping. I don't remember flying through the air. I just remember I hit my head. I don't know how far I fell, but 
had to be 30, 40 feet at a time. You have no control. You just hope you land and survive. Charlie helplessly plummets to certain death. <laughs> but a rock ledge jutting out of the cliff face breaks his fall and saves his life. The ledge that I landed on was no more than maybe six feet deep and maybe 10 feet wide. I looked up. I couldn't go up, it was too steep. Looked down. It was steeper than heck. I was trapped on a rock. It's, it's just an awful feeling. Teetering on the edge of a 500-foot drop, Charlie must literally cling on for his life. But the fall has shattered his right wrist and badly damaged his spine, and the blow to his head has left him with severe concussion. Blasted by the freezing wind, his survival instincts kick in. Soon after, I was just overcome with the pain of my injuries. My whole right arm was just numb from pain. It immediately swelled up and the right side of my head hurt like mad. I knew that the only way I had a chance to survive Charlie! is to get warm. So I wanted to get that tent up and get inside my bag and try and warm myself. I was in such a confined space, there was no room to move. The ground was hard, I couldn't stake it into place and pull it tight like you would normally do. So I finally got on my bag and rubbed myself, tried to get warm and dry off. I distinctly remember for one split second realizing how lucky I was to survive. I kind of got warm. I kind of gained my senses a little bit. I thought, well, I got a cell phone. I could try that. It didn't work. Beep, beep, beep. Because of the lack of the signal. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I became very despondent because I knew at that point there's no way I'm going to ever reach anybody from the outside world. Isolated and trapped on the ledge, Charlie is in urgent need of medical attention. Worse still, he isn't due to finish his hike until Saturday, in a day's time. Until then, no one will even suspect he's in trouble. All I could do at that point is wait. So I surmised that if anybody's gonna come looking for me, they're gonna wait two days. So my job at that point was to try and survive and bide my time until Monday. But Charlie's food supplies are running dangerously low. He only has a handful of snacks left. I knew I had to kind of ration what little food I had left, which is mainly trail mix and granola bars. I was hungry all the time. Once his food supplies run out, Charlie knows he won't be able to last very long without help.
As night falls, the temperature on the mountain plummets to below freezing. Physically and mentally drained, Charlie desperately needs rest. But pained by his injuries and balanced precariously on the tiny ledge, he's too terrified to sleep. I quickly became aware of how uncomfortable this ledge was. If I fell off the front, I would have tumbled several hundred feet. I just could not sleep. I don't think I slept the whole time. Most of all, I was scared. The solitude that I was so much craving turned into feeling alone. There's a big difference between those two. So I became very frustrated, very kind of angry at myself. And most of all, I was kind of scared about where I was and how in the heck I'm ever going to get out of here. In the fall, Charlie lost all his precious water. Without anything to drink, his condition will rapidly deteriorate. I was thirsty. I hadn't had a drink of water probably in, you know, 10, 12 hours. And so it occurred to me, well, I could melt some snow. Charlie is surrounded by snow, but he must melt a huge amount to get just a tiny drink to quench his thirst. And it means he has to venture out onto the icy ledge and risk plunging to his death on the rocks 500 feet below. Getting out of the tent was precarious because of a lack of room. The edge of the ledge, it was kind of rounded off to nothing and it'd be easy to slip. So I had to be real careful. I had to fill up my pot of snow first, then bring it in, and then start boiling. It's a lifeline for Charlie, but he has only a limited supply of fuel. It's essential he makes every drop count. And you boil a pot full of snow, you only get about this much of water. It was quite the effort to melt snow just because of my hand. And I didn't have much fuel. And once I did melt snow, that little bit of water sure tastes good. Charlie's meager water supply is enough to sustain him for now. But he will have to keep melting vast amounts of snow to stay alive. Back home, his girlfriend Julie is wondering if he has successfully completed his solo hike. Charlie was due to come out on Saturday. I was looking forward to, to seeing that he, hearing from him and seeing that he, he'd made it out. But there's no sign of him at the agreed rendezvous point. I suspected that he was just delayed because of the weather and that he would, he would be out soon. We didn't think it would be unreasonable to wait one more day. You know, maybe he, he needed an extra day to get through. And at that point, I really wasn't terribly concerned. For Charlie, this solo mountain hike was a self-imposed test before his 50th birthday. But his desire to push himself beyond his ability has left him facing the prospect of dying alone in a freezing wilderness. It was just unbelievably cold. You are just chilled to the bone, and it plays games with your head. 
You're almost on top of the world up there, and the wind was just howling. You're alone. I was really questioning my, my motives, my desire uh, about being up there. Charlie survives a second torturous night without sleep. But after 48 hours trapped and critically injured, he's desperately weak and is starting to suffer the effects of dehydration. You stop urinating, your mouth becomes dry. I knew I had to melt snow in the morning and melt snow in the evening, but I only could do it at those times because I only had limited fuel. In the freezing cold, lighting the stove is already an awkward process. But with Charlie's shattered wrist and suffering a concussion from the blow to his head, it's become a potentially lethal mission. In trying to light the stove, I spilled a little bit of, of gas, and so I mopped it up with my bandana. finally did light the stove. The gas beneath lit on fire. So I grabbed my bandana, which was already wet with gas, in an attempt to put it out. That lit on fire, burnt my hands. I released it and it started my tent on fire. The fire has burnt the last of his fuel. His only way to produce water trapped on a tiny ledge, hundreds of feet high on a sheer rock face. Waiting an extra day to see if Charlie would show, Julie knows something has gone badly wrong. She alerts the police, and a search has begun. There was a group of over 20 people geared up and ready to go. Three helicopters, um, a dog team. I felt worried for him, wondering, did he fall? Did he get hurt? I was very concerned about his food and water situation. Being that he had only planned for so many days, I was completely consumed. That's, that was all I was interested in, was finding Charlie. After 48 hours, stranded in sub-zero temperatures, with a broken wrist, damaged spine, and severe concussion, Charlie finally hears a sign that his ordeal could be over. I heard some helicopters. They were quite distant at first. But then they became louder and louder. So I heard them, couldn't see them. And they became louder and louder. I had a sack on the end of my fishing pole. Just in case I did see somebody in the air, I could wave to them. From the air, 
Charlie is a mere speck in a vast mountain range. This could be his only chance. Despite the pain of his damaged back, it's vital he makes himself visible. I shouted, but I, it was useless be, because it, it's so vast out there. I'm here! I'm here! The whole time I just sat outside hoping to spot them or they would spot me, but I did not see any helicopters. I'm here! The sound of rotor blades is tantalizingly close. But hours pass, and Charlie catches no sight of an aerial rescue. It just felt awful. I was on the face of this one steep mountain. They were on the backside. I know I'm not going to see anybody. So I was really concerned and, and scared. It's a bitter disappointment. Alone and helpless, Charlie can do no more than hope he survives a third freezing night trapped on the ledge. I had this little map that I, I, I jotted notes on the back. It was like, you know, a little journal so to speak. I recall noting that it was probably the worst day of my life. I started thinking about being home, being with Julie. I wanted to get back to normality, you know. My focus was wondering what he was going through and how he was feeling. I was, I was safe. My main concern was always Charlie and what, what he was going through, what he could be potentially experiencing. I was really down at that point because I knew uh, I might not make it out unless somebody comes finding me. I, 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 uh... I knew I was lost. I knew I couldn't go anywhere. Charlie Hedge has been trapped on a rock ledge for three days. With severe concussion, an injured spine and shattered wrist, he's in urgent need of medical attention. But search helicopters have failed to spot him. Dehydration is seriously weakening him, and his food supply has all but run out. I was very hungry. I lost all my food Tuesday morning. I didn't know what I was gonna do for food. There was no nuts. No leaves. There was no nothing around. There's rock and snow. <sighs> Starving to death at that point became certainly a possibility. It was a desperate feeling. I really do not want to feel that way anymore. The whole ordeal was just extremely terrorizing. I was scared. I was in a lot of pain. I was feeling alone. But the silence on the ledge is broken once more. It's a glimmer of hope. Over here! I heard the helicopters come back. It was so loud, I knew they were so close. I knew they were just up over the ridge. And then I 
even saw one briefly coming in sight out of the ridge line. disappeared real quick. A second attempt to find Charlie has ended in failure. He knows his girlfriend Julie has details of his planned route, but he can't understand why the helicopters aren't searching closer to the path from which he fell. Things became real quiet. And so Tuesday afternoon, I thought they were, they quit looking for me. I didn't hear a thing. The helicopters fly on without spotting Charlie. He turns again to writing his journal on the back of his map. But this time, he takes a closer look at the route he was supposed to have taken and makes a shocking discovery. I finally realized, looking at that, looking at the geological features out in front of me, I realized that I went over the wrong pass. I was not facing east on Italy Pass. I was facing north, so I was on the wrong pass. It's a devastating blow. Charlie knows the helicopters are looking for him in a different valley. All hope of rescue is gone. Realizing that, thinking that they quit looking for me, I had to, I, I, I can't stay here, I'll just, I'll dwindle and die. Charlie faces his fourth night on the mountain. Without food or water, he knows he can't survive another day and there's little chance of rescue. It's life or death, but can he save himself? I was certain that they stopped looking for me. And so what am I gonna do now? I thought I'm gonna have to try and get out by myself. Pinned to an icy ledge, Charlie Hench realizes that rescuers are looking for him in the wrong place and may never find him. He must take action or surely die. His only choice is to attempt to scale the sheer rock face, despite his injuries. I went into panic mode thinking, if I'm gonna survive this, I gotta try and get out. I knew I couldn't go down, it was, it was out of the question. And I kind of surveyed the landscape above me. And I said, I'll, I'll try this way up, up and to the left as I face the mountain. Oh but with a badly damaged spine and broken wrist, every inch Charlie climbs is agony. My hand is broken, so it's most difficult. You're kind of hugging these rocks one-handed. It, it was just very tough. I made it under, around, over these humongous boulders. <laughs> I scrambled over, you know, three or four rocks. And then just, I, got, I, I couldn't go up anymore. Didn't know what to do, so I just sat on the rock right where I was kind of like trapped. I 
I was trapped on an even smaller rock, and I thought I couldn't go down, couldn't go up. I was literally stuck even in a worse spot. And it was early evening, and so I, you know, I just I didn't know didn't know what to do, and so I made the decision. Well, well I, I just I'm just gonna stay here. What else can I do? Charlie's shattered wrist and weakness from dehydration make scaling the near vertical cliff face impossible. Away from the shelter of his tent, he is now totally exposed to the icy wind and the temperature plummets. It was just so uncomfortable. Not only could you not sleep, but you were just uncomfortable in the position you were. And at that, I, and I thought it was, you know, I didn't think I was going to make it. A, I was so uncomfortable. B, they, they uh, stopped looking for me. So I just laid awake all night, looked at the moon. That was the darkest time, I'd say. I was very discouraged at that point. I did not sleep well during those nights. I thought something had happened that um, I would never see Charlie again. As the night wears on, exposed to the freezing temperatures, Charlie risks dying of hypothermia. It was the longest night of my life. I had to stay awake all night. Didn't have to, I had no choice. I wrote a few things out, you know, like a, a lousy attempt at a will, because I thought it was all over, and I just kind of, you know, divvied up the little things I have to people I know and love. It's, it's an awful feeling. Against the odds, Charlie survives the bitter night. But the ordeal has taken its toll. I was not going to spend any more time on this rock, and so I chose the lesser two evils, which was the ledge. And I'm looking forward to climbing back in my bag, and you know, I was going to I was going to write some last words. So I scrambled my way back down. It took me 20 or 30 minutes with one arm and two feet and hoping for the best. But just as Charlie has all but given up on life, he finds a last possible lifeline. I'm thinking maybe I could start a fire. It never occurred to me to start a friggin' fire. Maybe I could light a fire, you know, as a signal for another helicopter, other hikers. But I didn't have much. I had some old magazines. And I had some plastic slippers. I figured, well, plastic sandals might smoke. But I had like three, four matches left. My hands were just all torn up. My wrist was broken, so I think I tried to strike them with my, my left hand. Uh, first match, you know, lit and wouldn't light the paper. Second match the, my, got wet because my fingers were so uh, wet to begin with. I 
forget what happened in the third match. And so at that point, that's when I started to say, well, I'm just gonna maybe go to sleep. I was so tired. Back home, Charlie's friend, Dave Gra, is growing more concerned about the failure to find his body. As a trained pilot, he decides he needs to get involved in the search and try to save his friend. Tuesday night, I think I woke up um, you know, several times during the night and couldn't help but think of, of Charlie and, and thought that, well, I need to do something. 35 years earlier, Dave's brother got lost in a storm hiking the same trail that Charlie has been following. He has a hunch that the helicopters have been looking in the wrong valley. I was thinking about my brother's accident. If it's snowing or windy or something like that, it can be downright dangerous. It can be fairly easy to get lost. So I had to climb very, very hard and still had to probably circle around a, a bit to get up over the, over the mountains. Look down and, and uh, try to, to you know, scour the rocks for someone that might be um, you know, stuck there. But this aerial search also ends in failure. I couldn't uh, help but be disappointed that he wasn't there. I wasn't going to find him. Um, and that probably was not good, given the, you know, the weather and the time that had gone by. After almost six days, trapped alone on an icy rock ledge, Charlie has given up all hope of surviving his ordeal. Death itself now seems a welcome escape. At that point, I'm so depressed and tired and, and hungry and dehydrated, thinking no one was looking for me more. So I was really in despair. I was just totally numb. It was probably my lowest point. Charlie knows that rescue teams are looking for him in the wrong place and that no one will find him. It's only a matter of time before he dies. I was a beaten horse, you know. I had a buck knife and I thought it'd be easier if I end it. Too many friends that love me and I love life too much. There's no way to go for a man like me. Just weeks away from his 50th birthday, this trip was supposed to rejuvenate his life. Now, Charlie waits for a slow, agonizing death. I hear this plane. And he and he's and he's at, you know, he's above me. This guy is, you know, almost at my sight. And so I got my fishing pole with my stuff sack on. I'm waving, I'm waving it. I'm here. And then, then he goes by, and I wasn't sure he saw me. Over here. So then he, he turns around, he comes like right toward me again. Oh, I'm 
way my bag. He, and he, uh, he does the wing dip, you know, like you see on Star Wars or, or and, and that. And uh, <laughs> I just thought that was the best thing that wrapped him right there. After nearly a week, trapped alone on a small rock ledge, Charlie Hench is finally found. Following a gut instinct, his friend Dave decided to search the far side of the mountain pass, close to where his brother was lost, one last time. Well, it was, it was pretty amazing. I mean, I guess um, uh, Charlie could be described as a needle and the, the mountain's a haystack, and, and I did find that needle in a haystack. I've actually been to the ledge where he was stuck, and I've been there during the summer. And it's a, it's a pretty scary place. Charlie could have been killed. My experience in that whole thing is that it, it turned out good. I mean, Charlie and I have quite a you know, bond that we wouldn't have had you know, before, um, and that's, that's something pretty, pretty special. When we got the call that they found Charlie, I mean, it was, it was pure just elation. We both just fell apart, and you could just hear it in his voice that it was, it was pretty traumatic. So uh, I was just very thankful. He's a survivor. That's just, you know, he's, he's a tough guy. Charlie received emergency treatment for his broken wrist, lower spine, and head injuries. And when he returned home, was welcomed like a hero. I finally got back to town and saw Julie. I was just thrilled. She's a big part of my life. And I was just very happy to see her. It was just the little things that kept me alive that I wanted to return to, you know, that I love so much. <laughs>